Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, we cover autonomous teams and cover a lot of social aspects that are in and around creating software. I have my guest Michael Feathers on, who's currently director at R7K and chief architect at Globant. I'll put the links to his socials in the description below, and with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond Coding. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. If I were to ask you, what, what makes a team really a team? What would you, what would you say about that? Because I think there's a lot of aspects that go into that. Yeah, what makes a team really a team? Yeah, that's kind of a fascinating one. Mm. Um, I guess there's all these different dimensions we can kind of like um, think about in conjunction with that. Um, I think for me, the main thing is you just feel comfortable with the people you're working with. Okay. And you've gotten to know them pretty well. And essentially, you're able to share technical knowledge and um, lore about the history of the system that you're working on. That kind yeah. Of thing. yeah, I love that. But that that's not really technical, right? Any team can do that. But you need to know each other also even more on a personal level then. Don't you think? Yeah, I think so. You yeah. know, at least just be convivial, I guess. It's kind of like just like, hey, how are you doing? How was your weekend? And and uh, you enjoy each other's company. You know, yeah. you basically found a way to go and kind of rapport. I think that's the main thing. Yeah, I, I think I completely agree. What I've noticed is that, I mean, everyone at my team is working more and more remote still, now that you can go back to the office. Um, but people isolate themselves also kind of socially, right? It's weird if we have stand up and we kind of uh, talk about stuff non-work-wise, um, even though people enjoy it. Some people are like, well, I, I need to get going, basically. Um, yeah. You don't really have those moments that you just grab a coffee with someone and get to know them basically, mm -hmm. which is weird. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah, I have. And it, it's a, it is a funny thing. It's really kind of a shame because, uh, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed that sort of thing, like an in-person working. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's one of those things that we really haven't figured out in the industry yet, or just in general with the world, with remote working, um, what we're actually kind of missing in terms of like body language and being in the same space with people, you know, yeah. I kind of wonder about the, from the, like the, um, mental health aspects also. I think there's this, there's lots of things that we try to abstract away. And then when we abstract away, we kind of like, you know, don't realize that we're suffering in some manner or we feel vaguely at unease, but we don't know exactly why. Yeah. Um, I think a great example of this is just like the thing of like, you know, if we move beyond the work realm, for instance, if you think about, you know, Twitter and social media, it's kind of like when you're communicating just by text with people, there's so much nuance that's missed, right? Oh, yeah. There's so much possible misunderstanding. Yeah. And I think the same thing is true with, um, even with remote audio and video, but it's like a, you know, to much lesser degree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have that, I have friends that are like interpreting a certain email with completely <clears throat> like a, a different, um, how would you say that? A different tone, a different attitude, but it's just text, right? That's their own interpretation of a piece of text. I'm yeah. like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that to me. And then when they talk to the actual person, they're like, no, 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 I didn't mean it like that. No, that's just how I write. I'm either, I mean, I'm Dutch, I'm direct. Uh, that's how it goes. I, I try to avoid text and email. But I mean, with remote now, everything's through Slack. Um, so mm -hmm. I think you need to know what people's preferences are in the first place. Or uh, I think take that extra step and putting that nuance in there. I think emojis are a great way of doing that. No. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, it's kind of fun that way. Yeah. But I think we've all found our ways to cope with it, which is kind of cool, you know, but it's still, uh, you know. <laughs> I think what's kind of rough for me right now, and I think, you know, there were a lot of people who were going and having a lot of conversation about remote working, yeah. I guess maybe six months or so ago because of COVID. And the, um, the question has always been kind of like, do we go back to in person? And under, yeah. under what circumstances do people actually do that? Do organizations do it? But I think there's a real forcing function there in the sense that so many organizations are hiring people remote and it's yeah. almost like, it would be impossible at this point to go and actually move back to uh, common facilities, I think, for many organizations. Yeah, so. that plus, I think uh, engineers have a preference. And I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm more and more on Twitter. I feel like that's moving towards remote. Uh, engineers are already scarce and hard to hire for. Uh, so I think yeah. if there's a, a stigma there, then organizations need to accommodate for it. Or they need to have something else that attracts engineers like a magnet we do stuff in office but we have other cool stuff um so yeah. you will probably want to come to the office also 
Yeah, I think there's that. I think the other thing that's kind of funny is I, I have also joked with friends about this thing of like maybe in five, 10 years or something like that, people are going to go and say, we did this spectacular thing and guess what our secret was? Our secret yeah. was getting everybody together, right? Yeah. And of course, everybody that was involved in the early Agile movement will just laugh at that point because we kind of felt from the very beginning that having people co-located was uh, you know, a great you know, a great thing that was really kind of like a productivity and culture exactly. enhancer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think for that sort of thing, it's probably going to happen with very rare projects. You know, it's, I always go back and think about like, um, back, I guess, like in the 1960s, there was mm-hmm. the, uh, they called them skunk works projects for like, I guess the like DOD, like the SR 71 Blackbird was a famous, you know, secret project. And they just basically put a bunch of people in the building yeah. and, um, you know, they worked for, I forget how many months yeah. doing this very intensively, you know, and, uh. You know that kind of thing can happen. I'm, I'm probably guessing it probably does happen in some some very uh, important tech areas. You know? Yeah, I have a, a buddy of mine who's building a remote startup, um, so he's hiring all over the world, and he says we still need thirteen get-togethers per year. I don't know why thirteen. Probably out of some book, uh, but I think that is has very much to do with the bonding you talked about in really forming yeah. that team, right? Having those kind of interpersonal moments face-to-face instead of kind of having them remote. Uh, I think yeah. that's very important. What I'm kind of waiting for is I think that, you know, it's kind of funny because people have talked about the whole thing about like in-person conferences also. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, an interesting opportunity for them is to go and actually have like, you know, hey, we're having a conference and half the day will be conference sessions. The other half is you and your teams, you know, yeah. basically co-located at the same place. Um, it seems like there's a good dual purpose aspect to that sort of thing, you know, get, exactly. kind of run a conference, but then also basically be like a hosting space for, you know, having those kind of, you know, team in company team meetings. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. If I think back to where I was kind of most effective, uh, I was in a team with people that I know, um, even on a more kind of interpersonal level, I knew also their skills. Um, and this was when I was kind of more early on in my career. Uh, so these are the people I needed to uh, kind of pull up towards. I think that's a Dutch expression. I don't think that's necessarily translatable. Um, but I needed to really put in extra effort to get to their level, basically. And they knew. They did everything they could uh, for kind of kind of doing that knowledge transfer. Uh, but we yeah. were within an organization and had a lot of trust within that project, had a lot of autonomy there as well to get it done, make the technology choices that we thought would best solve the problem, and then actually make it happen. Um, and I, I loved being in that team. I don't know why that isn't, why, do, why that doesn't happen more often. I feel like there's a lot of bureaucracy that goes in kind of organizing and managing teams, which is weird. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I agree with you that thing about that being like a great thing, early career, you know, mm. cause I had roughly the same thing. I was hired into a biomedical company and had a, a really cool technical challenge. I basically worked on with several people Yeah, and, um, it's, it's a great time to grow. And I think there's also that thing of um, if you've been around in the in the industry for a while, you basically have networked and gotten to know many people. Yeah. But for people just getting into the industry now, I think remote working has its own special challenges yeah. with regard to going and actually developing a network because it's not it's not quite as, you know, you don't get the deep bond thing, I think, online. Is exactly. Good, uh, in-person work situation. Yeah, I've, I've noticed onboarding is very hard because... Uh, yeah. And you need a special type of person that reaches out, right? And that doesn't sit with the problems they have. If they don't reach out, you're never going to figure out which problems they have. Uh, yeah. And therefore, I, th- I feel like onboarding has become that more difficult. Yeah, I think it is funny, though, for us to go and basically think that the forces really are kind of aligned towards basically having a lot more remote work. Yeah. So it's going to be a big challenge for us. And, then, you know, we are making headway on it. I think it's, uh, yeah. it's very interesting to see where we're going with that. Exactly. Um, the autonomy thing to me is very interesting, though, because you mentioned autonomy in terms of like, you know, in your early work experiences, going and working with people co-located and, yeah. and actually having having a common task you're working on, something hard, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny because I read a lot of literature about team autonomy and things along those lines. And it's really fascinating because it can be so energizing. Yeah. Um, but it's also like there's that interesting thing of that, you know, quite often the work that we do has to basically be coordinated with other work in other parts of the organization. Yeah. And so it's like that thing of going and figuring out how we actually best do that now. It's exactly. Really yeah. 
what do you think the like a good balance in there is because i've i've seen kind of the fully autonomous side but there i could i could see some pain points right that it would not necessarily fit in the organization how we would envision it or when we leave because we were kind of a task first agency model uh, we did a chunk of work and then we would leave outside of the organization the organization would need to adopt it i could see some issues yeah. there uh, us being effective but it not being there kind of long term uh, all of the time mm -hmm. i think it's hard to figure out the right balance there uh yeah i mean it's it's a thing that can work it sounds like you were able to do that i think it's just one of those things where basically being clear up front whether this is like a handoff situation or it's really something which is meant to be yep. durational across the organization um i think the the thing that i find very interesting right now is um, we know that teams feel better when they're working aut autonomously, yeah. but it really touches on so many other things. Like if you're working on a product, what's the architecture of the product? And is it set up in such a way that you can really kind of minimize the, the amount of coordination that has to happen and yeah. uh, enough to basically allow certain teams to have a great deal of autonomy. And, um, I think, you know, when you start getting into the area of like what's standardized within an organization, so it's kind of like. Yeah, you've got autonomy, but you know you have to do this, 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 and this. So it's kind of like the semi-autonomy thing, and um, yeah. it's very easy in people in another part of the organization to basically come up with things that you have to do, and then it's kind of like <laughs> never really see what the impact is, and basically go and see that at a certain point, the team starts to feel that almost everything about their work practice is dictated. That's yeah. really kind of problematic, you know. Yeah, I guess so. But if from an organizational point of view if you would have too much autonomy or kind of full autonomy, I think you would have kind of technology spin out of the out of the woodworks, basically languages you might have never heard of because they fix certain problems very distinctly, but maybe are not very uh, good for longevity, right? If you can't hire for a certain programming language, should that be within your organization for the long term? Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. And it's funny, I love that you asked that question because it makes it leads me to this thing I keep thinking about over and over again within the industry, which is kind of like how long should code live, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's this interesting thing is that there's lots of constraints that we place on ourselves because of the technology that we have and the fact that we don't really kind of like cycle it as much, yeah. you know? Um, so I don't know, just as a way of going and getting back to that question, some of the earliest microservice implementations, there was a company called Forward in the UK yeah. And they did one of, I think, the earliest microservice things, right? Okay. And, um, you know, for them, the type of business they were in, basically they would write services that would only have to last for a couple of months. Mm. So there was no problem for them at all to go and just basically use a random research programming language and just kind of know that if things weren't working out, they were going to rewrite it anyway or just sort of like retire that service and build new ones. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's that interesting thing where, you know, it's the things that persist in an organization that basically become constraints. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And if we can find a way to make them not persist, then we basically have a bit more freedom. Yeah. But you're already with an organization, you have so many ties starting off with the programming language of the implementations, the previous implementations that are there, you're probably going to hire for those, right? Because those need to be maintained within the cloud environment. You have three big players. I mean, Alibaba cloud, I'm not necessarily considering, uh, but as your mm -hmm. Google Cloud Platform uh, and AWS, you're also tied to those. I've seen companies mm -hmm. migrate, but I think that's a very costly decision. Uh, even yeah. the infrastructure that you're on currently, you're already, you already have some ties, right? You can only move so much. Yet you do mm -hmm. see organizations rewriting their stuff, moving towards either a new language or a different framework because they think that is going to be more future-proof than the stuff they're on now. But it's mm -hmm. very, it's always going to be gradual. I feel like I don't think, um, I don't think code actually has an end once it's in production. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the hard thing. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing with this too, because, you know, I, I, I tend to basically think of software as biological in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of yeah. like there's, you know, we say that code doesn't really have an end point and then I'm start thinking, well, in almost every other aspect, it has the same kind of growth characteristics as biology. Yeah. But the thing that biology has that code doesn't is essentially apoptosis, which is essentially like programmed, you know, cell death, for instance. Right. Yeah. So the, the thing that's really unfortunate for us is that we have nothing which basically goes and says that code should only last for five months or five years. Yeah. If we had that, it would solve a lot of problems. And it's 
really kind of hard to advocate for that sort of thing because that means continuous rewriting of things. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you look at the, the trade-offs, that may not be the worst thing. You know, I basically visited organizations where they are, you know, they're working in systems that were come from like three companies ago. Right. Yeah. And they're 30, 40 years old and nobody can get rid of them because they are so valuable, but it becomes a trap. Yeah. And that's really kind of awkward. You know, I would, I would love to see a study. First of all, uh, I had an episode with Jessica Kerr and she said the exact same thing. It's more analogous to biology now. Um, and we yeah. had a, a, a metaphor of kind of an organism. And when you needed to shake hands with another organism, just a hand would appear and you would shake hands with something else. And at the end up, you would end up with kind of a monstrosity of like seven different arms and missing fingers just to kind of map out your organizational structure and the interfaces that it has. Uh, yeah, I think I, anything, anything that... Um, when change is easier by adding things rather than changing what's there yeah. in an existing way becomes like biology. It's kind of like the growth of cities also. It's hard to tear down buildings to make new buildings. Yeah. So you end up having new buildings and old buildings and buildings that you refurbish, right? Yeah. So there's a biological aspect to a lot of, you know, growth oriented, um, uh, building. Yeah. I, I love that example. That, that is exactly how it feels to me as, as a software engineer. Right. We have mm -hmm. old streets, we have old cities, and somehow, somewhere, we need a new building. We make we make it happen. That's how it feels. Yeah. But we n we never clean up. We never. Sometimes we demolish, but also uh, gradually. Basically, it's not radical. Uh, it's nothing mm -hmm. like uh, cell deprecation. Basically, I would love to see yeah. a study where they continuously rewrite every x amount of months and see uh, see what happens. Yeah. Well, I did some research into this years ago. I mean, not like doing that directly, but actually kind yeah. of looking and seeing, you know, is there a good threshold point for going and rewriting things? And, yeah. you know, the thing I could, the thing I could find in the literature that was kind of interesting was this notion of like saying that as things grow, basically does, uh, how does like a defect count get affected by growth of things? Right. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, the hope that they had was, would be, was that there would be some inflection point past which you could say this thing should be rewritten because when you go, past this point, then basically can have a massive increase in number of bugs, right? Yep. But it ended up being rather like a smooth curve in a way. So it's kind of like just the bigger things you get, the more buggy they become, right? Exactly. Which is unfortunate because you've got an inflection point, at least you'd have something which would be a good prompt for going and doing yeah. the rewrite of things. You know? That would be easy. Um, yeah. So it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, it would be easy. So the thing that's weird about that is to go and think about, you know, how do we actually get mechanisms in place to go and actually choose to rewrite things in order to... And it's always going to feel preemptive, you know, yeah. and that's um, kind of unfortunate about this. But, uh, yeah. you know, I when think it, one thing that is kind of nice is that that was part of the original story around microservices in a way is that you just get to rewrite the services. Interesting. And, um, you know, you can look at the services being almost being like cells in an organism in a way, right? Yeah. Um, but people just don't do it often enough. So. Yeah. It's, it's a shame, I feel like, whenever we do something that's preemptive, People think it's a waste or kind of stakeholders or, or maybe even a yeah, product so owner thinks it's a waste. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, but I love the example. I, I had an episode with Hassan Habib and he says we, mm -hmm. we implemented something which is called code rub. It's like rubbing your glasses. Every day you pick yeah. up a file, see if it's still neat, if it still makes sense. Otherwise you polish it and then you put it mm -hmm. back. That's it. And it's daily. It's continuously. And I think it's because... The thing you mentioned that it's it doesn't really have an inflection point, right? It's continuously and it's kind of curving off with regards to complexity uh, and stuff that you need to rewrite. That you need kind of a continuous process there. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I think that's good, and I, I think the it, it reminds me of something that feels like it's good to talk about, which is that I think that the picture that people have in their minds of code bases is yeah. not terribly accurate sometimes, mm. and the way that I'll approach talking about that is that, you know, what you just described is like a random process. We're randomly going to go and find something, right? Yeah. But um, when you look at basically like the commit history of any code base, you'll discover that there are some areas of the code base that get massive amounts of change over time and others that maybe have like one or two commits ever in like five years, mm. for instance, right? Yeah. And it tends to be like a power law distribution. So you basically have like um, a smaller area of the system that gets many, many commits, and then lots of areas that have, you know, very small number of commits. And, you know, if you're looking at where you want to go and concentrate effort in a system, yeah, um, that's a great, you know, a great guidepost. Of course, these hotspots are going to kind of like move around over time within a code base. And 
that's fair, but there are some things that are rather persistent. Yeah. And um, so I, I think there's that interesting thing of like, once you really sort of internalize that, then you're kind of like in this space of like, well, you know, we know there's a high level of criticality in this area and we can treat this different. Yeah. You know, we can basically go and have rules of engagement about how we actually work in that area. And, um, you know, maybe even do the thing of going and saying, like I was mentioning earlier, preemptively, we're going to have a preemptive rewrite schedule for some of these things just because, yeah. you know, so I think that hasn't really been internalized across the industry as well as it should be. No, no, I was, I always, I mean, I talked to a lot of people uh, yeah. and at one point I think I asked someone, I forget who, but what would make kind of the engineering experience better, right? What would make engineers more effective? I feel like we have a lot of tools, but I feel like sometimes it's something's missing when kind of defining a mental model on what the code base actually reflects, right? Because my mental model is something, what the code base actually is, is probably something mm -hmm. else. There's a mismatch there. And I feel like we need something uh, to better internalize what is actually out there. What, what have we created? And also have that kind of aligned within a team because there's even more mismatches there. Um, yeah. And what you mentioned kind of really triggered mm -hmm. me in, in, I think that would help a lot where you see where the hot spots are, kind of the hot areas. Uh, that would at least bring focus or attention to the right places even. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And it's funny, there, I might take a chance to go and mention this now. There's something I got from Kent Beck many years ago, the yep. founder of like Extreme Programming. He basically wrote someplace that if you can't explain your system using four objects, you don't have an architecture, which is kind of like a very, <laughs> you know, direct way of saying something which is kind of profound and true, right? Yeah. But an exercise I kind of like got together from that insight is something I enjoy doing with teams, which is kind of like, Let's say you and I, Patrick, we're working on a system together yeah. and we know it very well, but I'm going to say, let's play the story of the system game. And then you'll say, hey, Mike, okay, let's do that. And I'll say, hey, Patrick, the system we're working on, explain it to me using just two objects, right? Yeah. Two things, two entities. And then you have to think for a second, what's the two most important responsibilities the system has? Yeah. And what's the high level messaging that would happen between them? And it's really kind of like a, a gross, gross simplification of what the system really does. Yeah. And the thing is that when you tell me that, you start to know where you're sort of like oversimplifying things, okay. where it's kind of like a lie in a sense. And then you get to ask yourself, well, gee, why couldn't it be that simple? And then you yeah. start to go and get this sense of like, you know, what's more important, what's less important, ways that communication can be consolidated and stuff like that. And then we'll go back and forth and I'll say, okay, well, let's go and expand it out. Let's make it three objects, four objects, five objects. Yeah. And in the process of doing this, you're kind of like centering in on what the most valuable, you know, critical responsibilities in the system happen to be. Yeah. And this is a great way of going and getting some degree of consensus on a team about, you know, what the most important things are. What's the simple story you would tell to people about how the system works. Yeah. And then you start thinking, well, how do I keep that story simple without the exceptional cases that are jarring to people when they go into the code and try to go and make changes. Yeah. And um, I find that very valuable. I, the thing you were mentioning earlier about like the distance between us and the code, it's like, I think we're always going to have that, but maybe the best thing that we have as an antidote in a way is the fact that we can communicate with each other yeah. and that you have a different view than I do. And then we can communicate those things and um, hopefully arrive at, you know, kind of like a, a closer <laughs> truth of what the code yeah. is now. Yeah, kind of a consensus. But even, so I, I, I was thinking how that would happen within my team, right? But we kind of have mm -hmm. roles and responsibilities, even uh, we're currently not operating full stack, for example. So people that would more, be more UI oriented, uh, what people actually see, will give a completely different answer than people that are more backend oriented, more data, uh, even event driven is our current system. So those yeah. answers will completely be misaligned, I feel like it would be hard to get them even to a consensus if your team isn't aligned in what it's doing kind of throughout technology. Um, yeah. But still we... And that, that is a rough thing. There's areas yeah. of specialization that we just feel that we have to kind of pursue that way. But I, I love the thing of like walking somebody else's shoes for a period of time. It helps. Yeah. To, you know, there's things that you miss, that we miss when we're kind of like yelling across the fence of our disciplines. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, I've experienced both. So uh, within a team, everyone's responsible for kind of everything. And obviously mm -hmm. within that, you have specializations, people that know more about X than Y, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but also people where currently my role is, is a backend engineer. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. really touch the front end. I do some stuff here and there because I can. Uh, but my main focus is more on the backend side because the skills are required there. Uh, and I'm one of the people that can actually do that. So we do have kind of that 
kind of roles and responsibilities within our team. But there's also mm -hmm. a kind of distance that gets created because of that, because we are not doing the same thing. We can, yet yeah. we don't. Uh, and I do feel some some friction here and there sometimes because that is there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it'll always yeah. be there. If uh, yeah, I think it'll always be there. It's yeah. it's like I think the thing I always hope for with teams is that they basically get to the point where they realize that that these are the dynamics, you mm -hmm. know, and then it's kind of like and they can see the situation the way that you see it with your team. Yeah, and then go and say, okay, well, this is the way we're kind of oriented right now what can we do to kind of mitigate the bad effects of it? Yeah. Right. Can we have like more communication? Can we have show and tells or something like that in order to go and sort of like, let me get myself into the, you know, the, the mind frame of being a front end engineer to be able to go and at least see that world. Yeah. So I can make better decisions about things that I do. Right. And you know, it, it takes a great deal of self-reflection and systems awareness to see these things. And I, that's one of the things I just, I always hope for. So I think a lot of my communication with people is about getting them to see those things. Yeah. 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 I love having like a conversation that triggers kind of a reflection point about mm -hmm. what we've been doing or kind of uh, you're a puzzle piece and how the bigger picture kind of fits together in a way. Uh, because that's, it's hard to get that from your own point of view, right? You really need a time and a place to do that kind of reflection. And for me, a mm -hmm. trigger is way easier than setting a, a, a time and <laughs> a place for myself to think about that. But yeah, maybe it's needed. Yeah. Oh. And I think that's the thing that we talked about a bit earlier with the whole thing with like um, remote work is that, you know, it's kind of like you don't really have the hallway conversation quite as easily. Yeah. So kind of work uh, that in. Yeah. I was thinking something triggered me. I don't know what, but I had a conversation, which was actually quite recent, um, where a certain problem needed to, to be solved. Um, and one of the stakeholders already said, I envision a team of like eight to nine people working on this problem just to get faster and stuff like that. Uh, and mm -hmm. I challenged that. I said, I mean, is that the actual number we're going for? Because with that many people, we're going to have other issues, right? You might think it goes faster, but throwing more developers in the same team isn't always going to make it faster. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be counterproductive for the for the problem that we're having. I, I was yeah. of the mindset that like a th team of three or four for this specific problem uh, would be best, but they, they completely disagreed. And there's kind of a dissonance in what the optimal team size is for the problem at hand. Um, I've always been in teams that are like three or four people, never quite larger than I think seven. Uh, yet there yeah. are teams that try that. Um, what was mm -hmm. your experience with that kind of team size wise? Pretty much. It's, it's the same thing. And I think yeah. what's fascinating to me is basically like think about how best to communicate this to people, what those, that constraint is. Um, I, one way I like to explain to people who are like maybe not in the technical realm is kind of like, okay, you've got a group of people who are getting together trying to figure out what restaurant to go and get dinner, right? Yeah. Is that an easier conversation among three people or among 10 people, right? <laughs> How long is the conversation going to be between, you know, three yeah. and, and 10? And, you know, the thing is for people that are systems oriented, you can just go and say, this is the N squared problem. They kind of get it, right? Yeah. If you have like in graph theory, you basically have a certain number of nodes, a certain number of edges. Um, as N increases, the number of communication paths increases by the square of N. And that's just, you know, a constraint that we have for going and growing things. Yeah. And um, that gets connected to like the Dunbar number. I mean, you know, for the number of people that people can know in an organization, there's all these loose constraints um, that we deal with all the time in software development. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting to consider consider how best to develop a bit of a language to go and discuss these things yeah. um, because they are real, you know, and it's, uh, we can try to go and be, you know, rather loose about them and say, Hey, but you can put, you know, 30 people on a Slack channel and it's going to work out fine. And it's like, well, no, you're still going to have that constraint and it's still, it's going to be easier with three or four people. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. The metaphor I like with that is that two people make a baby in nine months, more people don't make a baby faster than that. Yeah, which yeah. is kind of the same with, yeah. uh, with the restaurant thing. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny how old a lot of this knowledge is. There's this book, The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks back in, I guess, the 1970s. Yeah. About one of the first operating system projects for IBM. And he basically, you know, articulated Brooks' Law, which is adding late adding people to a late project makes it later. And essentially the argument is that N squared thing. It's just what it is. Yeah, yeah. So. What's your take on kind of, I mean, the tech... Uh, the tech sector right now is quite hectic. I feel like I feel like a lot of people are switching just because uh, salaries are increasing. There's more opportunity with 
companies hiring remote. Uh, so anywhere mm-hmm. where you are, there might be more opportunity if you are within the tech sector. But that also means a lot of friction for existing teams, right? A lot of people either flowing in or flowing out. Um, do you think that, I, I think that uh, a team takes time to actually form a team, right? We already talked about kind of having that interpersonal communication and knowing things about each other. But if you continuously have people flowing out and flowing in, I think that's very hard to get to a, a static level of comfort uh, and effectiveness. Yeah, no, I think that's a definitely an issue. And I think it's particularly now a problem because, you know, uh, the way the economy is, and I, I guess also um, yeah, just general issues of retention, you know, keeping people and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I think the interesting thing about this is I think that there's like an in-between spot with this, right? Mm. Um, People are coming and going, and it takes a while to go and gel a team. But I think there's also this thing that you can do organizationally where you have kind of like a team of teams in a way, where it's okay. not really like this bigger team is a cohesive team in any sense, but at least the people know each other well enough. Yeah. So that like, say you and me and maybe two other people can get together and work on something for a week. Yeah. But we don't have to go form new relationships because we already have a relationship, right? Yeah. And then essentially it's like maybe we kind of like reteam in a way. And I'm working with like several other people in the organization that I know already very well as well. Right. So there's this thing where we can, you know, we can basically have team boundaries that are changing, you know, yeah. more often than we expect in this bigger space, the slightly bigger space. Yeah. And um, that can be really advantageous, you know? So I think that getting used to that degree of change is actually something that's kind of useful in an organization as well. Yeah. I think that would work out really well actually it does go hand in hand with kind of short delivery cycles because then you would deliver a piece of software probably kind of reframe reshift in different teams where it's needed probably based on expertise also Uh, but that would also mean because you are interacting with so many people probably new people as well as people that you already know i think the knowledge gaps are going to be less big right because if you're the only security guy the only cloud engineer even the only front end or back end guy and you go away, oh, uh, my team has a huge issue or might have a huge issue uh, because that knowledge is gone. And because you're yep. kind of making those relationships, right, it's all people in a graph and lines in between, uh, that knowledge gap is going to be less huge, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, you mentioned earlier mobbing. And you know, mobbing is really a, a very important way of going and dealing with that sort of thing. Because if you you know, say you're working with like, you know, uh, a data engineer or something like that. Even if I'm not yeah. a data engineer, I can start to think about how that person thinks if I'm working with them often enough. Right. Yeah. Um, it'll help me if I'm interviewing other people, it'll help, you know, um, help me basically sort of arrive at some similar decisions, even though I may not have the deep knowledge that that person does. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, in, in a way it's kind of like so much of what happens in organizations these days is really kind of like about, uh, decentralized knowledge management in a way. Yeah. It's like us basically being aware of what needs to be known in the organization and making sure that we keep that knowledge alive. Exactly. And a lot of knowledge you're not going to use immediately, right? But it's going to mm-hmm. sit somewhere in your storage and at some point you're going to be like, oh, this is handy. You might not even know where you where you got that information from, but it is probably yeah. going to be from some, some sort of dialogue, some sort of interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it might not even be a technical problem you were solving it might just be someone giving their perspective you having a chat about whatever uh, which is also i think the the beauty of being in this space right a lot of the technical problems we've solved don't get me wrong there's still a lot of people solving a lot of technical problems uh, but i think a yeah. lot of them we've solved we're now dealing with more of the the biology aspect right the communication the team building everything around yeah. creating software uh, mm-hmm. and, it, and i don't see it changing I really enjoy like, you know, learning, you know, and I'm just curious about many things. And some of the, you know, most enriching experiences I've had in software development have been basically working with people who did not have formal CS education, but came from a wildly different field. Like uh, one guy I worked with, he basically went to school for political science and then discovered he could make more money, you know, doing web development. And he just had like a very, very different view of the world. And it was really enlightening in a way. And, um, you know, the more perspectives you can get on a team to go and uh, when you're in problem solving, the better off you are. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well is that sometimes going in, going really deep into your domain. Like I worked with a trading company once that basically brought in 
uh, special training in the depths of trading for their developers yeah. because they figured that having them have extremely deep domain experience would be extremely valuable for you know what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so never pass up an opportunity to learn something wildly different. It can often be useful. You know? Yeah, I, I completely stand behind that. Completely agree. I actually know a guy. Uh, his trading company has that with with the engineers as well that they learn something mm -hmm. about trading, um, and the other way around as well. That the, that the trading people, the domain experts there, know something about software engineering, right? Just the basics, yeah. because that already helps with the dialogue, I think. And the dialogue is crucial, right? Without com communication, nothing gets done. Wrong problems get solved. Uh, problems get interpreted incorrectly. Uh, nothing happens. But with that communication, with basic knowledge about what the other person is doing, makes it easier to speak that language, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's almost like a meta skill in a way. And it's like, if I think back about like my career, um, yeah, somehow I've always been kind of thrown in those situations where I've had to basically deal with people that have wildly different models of the world. Yeah. Um, I went to a university in Florida and practically everybody there came from another country. And so it's like, there was a bit of a language barrier and it was like that thing of picking that up. And then I worked at a research part company where um, I was working with biologists, fluidics engineers, yeah. uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, optom you know, uh, optical engineers. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, how do we even communicate with each other? It was just, yeah, I think it's really a key thing to be able to go and try to sort of glean another person's model enough to be yeah. able to go and sort of like find the common ground of communication. I, I completely agree. One of the, the benefits there, I mean, I joined a company and it was very multicultural. Like we had kind of eight different, countries where people would come from um, and we were all in Amsterdam kind of within the same team um, obviously mm -hmm. kind of in a team of teams uh, but still the conversations that you would have not I'm not even talking about the technical conversations but just learning about people I think it enriched yeah. me as a as a person right on a personal level and that made it so much more enjoyable to go to work to do the stuff that we're doing within that team right I think you'll always have a few things that you go to work for, for the actual stuff that you're doing, the people that you're doing it with, and probably why you're doing it, uh, because you can have several reasons there. And for me, the people that you're doing it with right now has always been the biggest factor. And I, I don't mm -hmm. think I see that changing. Yeah, no, it's a good thing. And I, I think the interesting thing for me is that I enjoy learning so much that it's, um, I feel like it, when you enjoy learning, then sometimes you feel you can get some kind of, you kind of direct it a little bit sometimes mm. too. So I think one way of directing it, which is kind of powerful for us in this industry, is to become genuinely curious about how the systems that we work on work, right? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, quite often we can get into this thing of like, okay, this is 10-year-old code. It's really difficult. It's going to be painful. And it's like, then you sort of flinch at the pain in advance of actually experiencing the code, right? Yeah. But you can also kind of like approach it, you know, metaphorically as if you're wandering into a jungle and you're exploring, you know, it's kind of like it's, you start thinking like somebody wrote this code this way. Why, why did they write the code this way? What's really going on with this particular thing? Yeah. And sort of relish when you get that experience of the light bulb going off, when you finally understand something that's rather complicated and rather alien to you in a way. Yeah. Um, so I think maintaining that kind of mindset when you're working in older code is often a a very enriching experience. And I try to go and communicate that with uh, people I work with because it's easy to get into that thing of like, oh no, I'm not working on the bright, shiny new things. So yep. it's kind of like, it's not good, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a wilderness out there and the wilderness is kind of fun sometimes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I wonder because, I mean, you still have kind of from an individual point of view, you want more knowledge, right? You want to learn probably what your goals are. Uh, you want to achieve those goals. It might be, uh, doing more database stuff, might be doing more cloud stuff, might be doing uh, completely something else within a certain domain. And then you have the team goals, right? And those kind of hopefully are aligned. But if they are not, is that going to create friction then? Are you going to trail off somewhere individually uh, while the team would benefit from you, you doing something else? I wonder how that kind of interoperates. Um, I think it comes back to that thing I was mentioning a little bit earlier is that if you go a little bit meta and you're basically at least aware of that situation, you can tend yep. to bet. I think that some of the most tragic circumstances I see are when it's kind of obvious to me that somebody has like a completely different goal than the team they're on yeah. and they're not even really quite aware that they're being pulled in that direction. Right. Yeah. I think it's kind of, rough. but if you're aware of that, then you can basically go and ask yourself the question, should I be here? You know, I think that's a very valuable question to go and ask. 
yeah. you know, if you have a deep interest at someplace else. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that can happen. I, I think there's quite often an awful lot of overlap. And as we've mentioned, you know, the, the benefit of having diverse opinions on one team is really kind of powerful. I think, you know, for me, when I feel like I'm in that space of like, oh, should I be here? Because this is kind of like, I'm really interested in that over there. Yeah. I can often find something that's very interesting locally as well. So, exactly. And then know that I can kind of like put that in my pocket. This is something I've learned and I'll be surprised maybe in, you know, three, four years that I pulled that out of my pocket and that was an experience that I, I had. I may not have appreciated it at the time, but it made me a better, you know, better developer or a better thinker today. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I am similar in that aspect that I, I will find stuff that is interesting to me that I can learn from, right? Even though the, the situation might not be optimal, I feel like I find the silver lining, the thing I can still learn. If that is not there, then I know, okay, this is probably my exit. I've learned all I have to learn or it's time to move on basically. But I've also seen the opposite where people are like, I've tried this thing. It's not working for me. I'm gone. I don't see anything else real quick. And I'm like, man, we have a plethora of things that you can still bite down on uh, and take ownership of, right? Really learn the depths of the depths there. Uh, but they don't see it the yeah. same. Yeah, and I think it's got to be a personal choice for most people. I, I think funny thing for me in, when I first got into the industry, I'm, I'm very much into music. And I yeah. kind of noticed that there were some musicians that basically would stay with a band for a period of time. And then they would just leave proactively because they're kind of like, I've learned everything I need to learn here. Mm. And I can go on and basically be part of the next thing and advance my career as a musician, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, people are going to have different inclinations around that. Some people, you know, enjoy doing that. They're kind of a bit of a personal journey to go and learn more about software development. And there's yeah. others that just are happy. I'm happy if, you know, basically I'm working the same system as working five years ago. Yeah. And, you know, I think those are both very valid ways of being, right? Um, there's, there can be downsides to moving too much. There can be downsides to staying in one place far too long, but it's something that we have to make as a personal choice and have to deal with the consequences. Yeah. Way. Yeah. I, I love you pointing that out because there is no optimal right, right route, right? There's too many choices, too many opportunities. Uh, everyone's environment is different, even when they came from, uh, everyone's yeah. journey is different. So I also don't think there's a perfect answer, a perfect choice, perfect opportunities. There's multiple good ones. So as long as you're aware of the opportunities, the choices that you have, and you pick one of them and you move forward, I feel like you'll be fine, right? Because you can still switch diagonally. You can make different choices. Don't dwell too much in the past. Oh, I should have done something else. But try and try and be aware of what you have learned, what you have gained uh, along the journey that you're on. I think one of the most valuable things that people can do for each other sometimes is to make them aware of the fact that they're making choices. Yeah. Sometimes people are doing things and they feel like they're that, you know, they're in a situation they may not like it, but for them to go and realize that it is a bit of a choice, you know, what yeah. you're kind of doing right now, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, you know, yeah, it's it's valuable information sometimes. I, I agree. I, I knew that when people complain that they're stuck and I'm like, you always you always have options, right? And I'll I'll try and figure it out together. Okay, these are the options mm -hmm. you have, right? Worst case scenario. Absolute worst case, you probably know what it is, right? You would remove yourself from that situation, but you could still have a dialogue with with X, Y, and Z. It might be your manager, it might be a teammate. Uh, and those conversations, they are not easy. Uh, they're not comfortable, uh, but they're very valuable because the more you have them, the better you get at them, the more you can understand the person sitting across from you. Um, and the more you're, you're aware of the situation, right? You're more aware of what's happening. You can probably have that communication to the best that you can. And you'll get better at it. Yeah, it's a difference between basically seeing your life as something that happens to you versus something you engage in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's also where kind of a, I think that's the same mindset where the people that don't find anything that's there to learn, they, they remove themselves from that situation because they're like, a lot of things have happened to me. I don't like it. I'll switch yeah. to something else. Yeah. I think about the possibility of change. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that was a, uh, I love the conversation. It started kind of from, uh, team autonomy and it kind of went all over the place. I loved it. Is there uh, is there still something that's missing that you wanted to share? Not really. I mean, it's, it's like there's any number of things that we could get into with this, but I think the, um, yeah, I like the fact that we basically sort of like did, did a good span across tech and social yeah. systems. So Yeah. Great. Well, uh, 
works for you, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> you will <laughs> ram it off then. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I I apologize again. We had lots of technical issues behind the scenes, uh, but I'm really happy we still had this conversation. Yeah, yeah me too. It's kind of funny. I, I think the one thing that's freaking me out a little bit is that basically like when the video is going back to me and I'm seeing myself on a delay video. Yeah. Which, I get that. It's, it's one of the cameras behind me. Yeah, those yeah. are the guys in the in the production room doing all the camera work. Uh, but let's round it off then. Michael Feathers, I'm going to put all his, uh, his socials in the description below. Um, if you've made it this far, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought about the episode. Um, and thank you again, Michael, for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the episode and want to support the show, don't forget to leave a rating. Better yet, share the episode with a friend. Let us know in the comment section below what you want to hear and we'll make it happen. Cheers.